meaning of the Hoffman, okay? Uh, you know, as I say, you know, you notice that there are obviously huge differences in all of these texts, but, uh, for example, the situation of the I is something that you can think of as, in a way, uh, linking them with, uh, without, 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 without equating them, obviously. Uh, the, uh, okay. Uh, let me, since I like to read, let me just read the few, first few lines there. Or some, somebody else would like to read that. I couldn't hog it, hog it all myself, you know. But who would, anybody else would like to? Enjoy doing it. I I went. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> I I'll, I can't. I'll take a paragraph. Yeah, try it. Um, you must all be very worried that I've not written for such a long time. I expect Mother is angry, and Clara may think I'm living here in a state of debauchery and altogether forgetting the dear angel whose image is imprinted so deeply into my heart and mind. But that is not the case. You are all in my thoughts every day and every hour, and in happy dreams, my darling Clara's figure appears before me and smiles at me with her bright eyes as sweetly as she used to do whenever I came into the room. But ah, how could I have written to you in the utter melancholy which has been disrupting all my mind? Something terrible has entered my life. Dark presentiments of a dreadful fate hover over me like black clouds, impenetrable to any friendly ray of sunlight. I shall tell you what has happened to me. I shall have to do so. I can see that, even though only to think of it brings on a fit of insane laughter. Ah, oh, my dear Lothario, how can I begin to make you feel in any way how what took place a few days ago might actually destroy my life? If only you were here, you could judge for yourself. As things are, you will certainly consider me a crazy spirit seer. Great, thanks. Yeah, very, very, nice. very, very well read, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see you're going to read in the get you read more in the future. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I start practicing. Huh? <laughs> yeah. um, I guess that you know the, the one of the things that's obvious there that I but that is interesting is right away the 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 way in which this introduction uh, emphasizes the visible, uh, the image, Clara, uh, her bright eyes. And then the contrast to that, dark presentiments of a dreadful fate hover over like black clouds impenetrable to any friendly ray of uh, sunlight and so on. And, and uh, um, so that uh, the, the, all the, the whole story that developed begins and in some way remains, remains associated with uh, the question of visibility. The visibility, uh, ultimately the visibility of the Sandman that will, will uh, there. And at the same time, there's a very interesting uh, complication of that uh, in which both acoustical and then tactile elements uh, come into the picture, but usually as menacing, in some way threatening, threatening elements. Uh, on the next page, on page 86, if you want to pick up uh, that time, except at lunchtime, uh, there, and maybe read that, that paragraph. Oh, me? <laughs> well, you did so nicely there. Okay, all right. Nice to somebody else's voice. Starting except at lunchtime. Except at lunchtime, we, my brothers and sisters and I, saw little of our father all day. Perhaps he was very busy. After supper, which was, in accordance with the old custom, served as early as 7 o'clock, all of us, our mother as well, went into our father's study and sat around the table. Our father smoked and drank a large glass of beer. Often he told us strange stories and became so excited over them that his pipe went out and I had to relight it for him with a burning spill, which I found a great source of amusement. But often he handed us picture books, sat silent and motionless in his armchair, and blew out thick clouds of smoke so that we were all enveloped as if by a fog. On such evenings, our mother became very gloomy and the clock had hardly struck nine before she said, now, children, to bed, to bed, the Sandman is coming. On these occasions, I really did hear something come clumping up the stairs with slow, heavy tread, and knew it must be the Sandman. Once these muffled footsteps seemed to me especially frightening, and I asked my mother as she let us out, Mama, who is the Sandman who always drives us away from Papa? What does he look like? 
There is. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. There is no yeah. Sandman, my dear child. My mother replied. When I say the Sandman is coming, all that means is that you are sleepy and cannot keep your eyes open, as though someone had sprinkled sand into them. Right. Yeah. So uh, it, it always took me this 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 very brief scene with the father is you know very suggestive. There. They said he's sitting around. His pipe goes out. It's like uh, it's all. It's, there's I mean, so much sexual. Uh, uh, connotation going on as a kind of loss of inability to keep things going and so on and he, he smoked, drank a glass of beer uh, he told strange stories became so excited that his pipe went out you know, and so on and I had to relight it with a burning spill which he found very amusing then he, he, gives, he gives the kids picture books and at the same time blowing out so much smoke that they can barely see Anymore, it's going on in the. So you, you get this, you know, very interesting sort of interaction between pictures, visibility, uh, stories, uh, strange stories. Doesn't say why they're strange. Um, uh, pipe going out, being re, you know relit, uh, and cr creating smoke. And then this, the smoke itself turns into gloom. My mother becomes very gloomy. Uh, and then you get an acoustical series. Of the, the clock strikes nine. So that interesting that you know the passage of time is is uh, the point where where the, you have a shift from an already problematic visible area involving uh, store strange stories smoke and going out and so on picture books fog and then uh, uh, it almost as if tolling the the bell is heard and then this, he then suddenly the the sound that the uh, the hearing the Sandman who's announced coming. I hear something come clumping up the stairs with slow, heavy tread. And this produces anxiety. So uh, the, the hearing without being able to identify what it is is a source of anxiety. And then uh, the, the answer to that is going to be able to identify what does he look like? What does it, uh, okay. what? And of course, so that the whole, this whole first part of the story is driven by the, this anxiety connected with acoustical and then the idea that somehow that can be alleviated by seeing, by seeing what he looks like. You know, he looks like uh, uh, there. And um, there are a couple of things there that I think are interesting. One is, one is very interesting. In, throughout the story, uh, the Sandman has access to the house. He's just there, which is very interesting. See, in other words, the house should protect, but the house, the doors are, are not, never, there's never any, any mention about how the Sandman gets into the house. He simply is there and you hear him coming up the stairs. You know? So in some sense, the, the Sandman is already in the house or can move into the house without, without there. And a part of his being in the house, of course, is that he has some uh, strange relationship with the father uh, there, and, uh, but also that there are these strange stories and even uh, uh, not only stories, but um, uh, what do you call it, proverbs, uh, uh, idioms, and so on, the Sandman. And then and you, you get this very strange, it's always struck me, even before I, I even knew about this story, the idea that this, the Sandman would, 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 would uh, be connected to going to sleep and keeping your eyes open, as opposed to having something in your eye. Mm -hmm. you know? I suppose they're talking about what you call sleep, in a little bit of crust that forms in the eye or something. But it is very, it's a very strange custom that, that it would be interesting to find out more. You know, I, I haven't been able to really retrace that very much because the, the fear seems like the logical one. If somebody throws something in your eyes, you don't go to sleep. You don't close your eyes. You can't close them. You know, you, uh, and everything that, so in a certain sense, uh, this whole story builds on a certain uh, uh, contradiction in not just in myths or in fairy tales, but uh, in a kind of uh, proverb, proverbial, you know, proverbial use of language. It's the Sandman, the Sandman, you know, you don't have to have a big, but of course then you get a story connected which goes further, a couple of paragraphs down, um, where he asks the old woman who looked after my youngest sister what sort of a man the Sandman was. And she doesn't, uh, she gives a very different answer. She says, oh, Matt, don't you know that yet? It's a wicked man who comes after children when they won't go to bed, and he throws handfuls of sand in their eyes so that they jump out of their heads all bloody, and then he throws them into his sack and carries them to the crescent moon as food for his children, 
who have their nest up there and have crooked beaks like owls and peck up the eyes of the naughty children. So this is a very different kind. The Sandman turned out to be a family man, but very different from the cares of the house father. Uh, he's just taking care to feed his, his, his young. And, uh, and you get something that's very characteristic of the fantasy in this story that leads Freud. Freud tries to explain by referring it to castration, which I don't think uh, is partial but not sufficient, namely that the eyes are ready to jump out of the head. And this idea of the eyes jumping out of one's uh, head. Uh, 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 and now there's something very interesting about that because uh, a certain notion of expressivity is, is used in order to, uh, to stress how the inside of a body, let's say a human body, can somehow control or, or, or influence the outside. So expre expression, uh, of verbal expression and so on, is, is something relatively reassuring. But here you get a literal expressing, you know, a literal pushing out of part of a body that the dismantles, begins to dismantle the, the unity of the body. And precisely at that point, which is responsible for reassuring the individual, that the individual is a unity, and that even, you, know, you can see objects and recognize them. Underdeck is Underdeck, we can find out where he lives, and you know, he's, it's it and I am I. He's there, and I can, I can place it, and I can place myself. And, 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 and so on. So there's an effort there. The eyes are, are in a way, crucial because of this uh, hope for function of identification, of placement, and, and uh, that will reinforce unity. And instead, you get precisely in this fantasy uh, uh, tale, the idea of the eyes bulging out of the head. And, 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 and uh, so expressivity turns into a nightmare, really. Mm -hmm. Something, uh, instead of reassuring and reconfirming bodily and, 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 and other uh, unity, it becomes uh, the possibility of, of uh, losing, losing that. And I think it's very interesting because um, uh, my sense is this is already anchored in Luther, but that it develops increasingly uh, in various ways over the next centuries, up until today, in, in, in the sense that one hopes from visual perception, uh, a kind of reassuring reorientation at the same time that one is constantly haunted by the fact that, that, that uh, what one sees may not at all be uh, what, what one is looking for and reassuring in, in this way. This is what I meant you know, before talking about the Kennedy assassination and, and, and the, ambiguity, the ambiguity of that. Um, so you get a valorization of the visual a visual experience at the same time that it's haunted by the fear that this visual experience can be uh, uh, full of dangers and so on. Mm -hmm. In Nietzsche, there's a famous uh, phrase, I think it's in, in yeah, in Zarathustra, I forget where. He says, uh, don't you, I think it's in The Vision and the Riddle, it's connected with the eternal return, or, I believe. Um, don't, we, don't we always look at, at abysses, uh, apkund, abysses, uh, there's no good word for that. At the, uh, we look, but art isn't everything we look at an abyss. You know, so you look at something, you see it, but what you see does not, uh, is not a window onto something stable, but is a window onto a void, onto a, is, is, is an emptiness, or is a, a worse, or is something that can swallow you up. Here it's actually, it's not just emptiness, you see, and that's what's very, uh, in a, there's a whole discourse of absence and emptiness that is, sounds very neutral if it isn't related to the fact that this, that if you see things that are empty, what really, the danger is that it can devour you, is that it can empty you, you become empty. That's why, uh, uh, that's what Descartes is worrying about, that's what, uh, and, and why he wants to find uh, an absolute certain, something he can, be, he can look at and think about and that is certain, if, if it only is his own thing, thought process and so on. Um, uh, in other words, the desire to identify an object of the house father is the desire to have a, 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 something, a vis-a-vis -vis from which you can stabilize your own, reassure yourself about your own stability, your own, your own self-identity, your own, your own stable positionality. Uh, that's why there's such an investment in this whole process of identification, recognition, uh, seeing and so on, and that's what's going to play. It's, that's what plays itself out 
I think in this in this uh, story, since when he finally does identify the Sandman, it's it, it's worse. It gets even you know it's the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. it, the end is already in the beginning, but mm -hmm. but but uh, um, and. Uh, so, in a way, this fantasy of the idea of the Sandman not uh, just allowing you to go to sleep and to rest and rejuvenate yourself, mm -hmm. but as throwing things into your eyes and then plucking the eyes out and feeding someone else, it's already mm -hmm. almost a kind of very bourgeois fantasy because it's like your eyes are going to be uh, taken away from you to, to serve someone else. Mm -hmm. So you get a whole question of uh, a struggle between property owners, to put it very, you know, crudely in a certain sense. One family, the other family, and so on. That's an agonistic kind of, of, of uh, you know, of uh, a, a struggle there. And uh, so he says, you know, the image of the cruel Sandman now assumed hideous detail within me. And when I, and when I heard the sound of clumping coming up the stairs in the evening, I trembled with fear and terror, and, and so on. And, and he, he's totally, totally uh, uh, terrified and uh, the, uh, it's, it's this terror that moves him then to try to see the Sandman even more. So it's a kind of vicious circle. You know, uh, the fantasy that, uh, that he already is worried about and that's already rooted there, it's already there from the beginning in some sense, uh, uh, um, is, is going to be uh, uh, intensified through this spiral. Uh, those of you who know a little bit about Lacan, this really fits quite nicely in some ways, uh, his relation of the, of the ego to the imaginary ego and the mirror phase and, and, and so on. You know, because in the, he, uh, he starts out thinking about the ego, and I don't know if you know that, that essay on the mirror phase, but uh, the idea there is initially is that the, the uh, human child uh, develops perceptual ability uh, in advance of motoric ability. So that the, the child can perceive unities or gestalt, figures, forms, before it can control its own body. And uh, so the, uh, and since from a Freudian point of view, this, the, the, the ego, the, the sense of the I as a unifying instance is based to some extent on the, a sense of the body as unified. Freud talks about it as a body ego. Uh, and since this doesn't exist motorically, uh, it, it, it becomes, uh, uh, Lacan says it can be its first experienced in either the mirror image of the child or the, the, the perception of, a, of the, usually the mother or the person who's taking care of the child. Uh, uh, the perception of a figure that can be understood to be whole which then allows the child, as it were, by ricochet, to think of itself as being whole, and that's the, the basis of its development of the sense of, a, of an ego as in some way a synthesizing, unifying, that's which holds you together over space and time. The problem with that is that uh, and Lacan's early theory is not really able to account for this, but the structure is very interesting. And it remains that way, is that the, the basis for your sense of being a unified self is a projective identification with another. Uh, that is the image, either the image of yourself in, in a mirror or the mother and so on. And this projective identification um, only works by being different from your immediate experience of your own discombobulated, not yet motorically controlled body. In other words, Lacan describes a kind of jubilation of the child before the, the, the mirror image that he said you don't see with animals, for example, in the same way. And it's this jubilation that's important, you see, the sense of, of, because, and I think the way it has to be interpreted as a sense of tremendous relief through a comparison of uh, motoric insufficiency, dis disunity in the, the child's uh, uh, body, and the, the first awareness of what a unified self or body, an image, could be. And so it's tied to an image, you see, uh, and it's tied to an image of a body. Uh, and an image more, more, uh, more generally, and so on. And uh, uh, Lacan's point is that this, this um, what he calls imaginary structure of the ego, if that's, that remains unchanged, it leads to a kind of a spiral of aggressivity because it is both forced to, to deny the difference of the other to oneself 
at the same time that it requires that difference in order to be a self. It requires a difference because it's in the place of the other that you make the first experience of what it might be, what something or, you know, unified might be, and yet it's, uh, you, are, uh, it's, you attribute that to yourself and therefore want to wrest it from the other, want to deny the other. And that, he sees, leading to a kind of spiral of aggressivity in regard to, to the other. That's where the symbolic then comes in, the signifier, the real, and so on. So I don't want to you know, get into a, a Lacanian <coughs> thing. But it is, in this, in this particular case, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it, I, I use it here because it seems very close to what's, in a certain sense, to what's driving him. He's looking to an image that will reassure him about his own physical safety, unifiability of his body. And what he's discovering is an image of this, this embodiment or this, this uh, of, of fragmentation there. And the, the particular form that's going to take is going to be very interesting because it then goes beyond the, the strictly interpersonal case. Because then what's very interesting is that what he finally, dis what he finally discovers as a Sandman is a lawyer. And I want to talk about that, but talk about that in the afternoon. Okay. So it brings in the whole question of the law. So, um, I so the, the, um, the, 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 uh, this uh, sort of approach of the Sandman and uh, a lot of the anxiety producing elements there are associated with sounds that pretty much fit or actually are in between the sort of, mm, sort of melange of uh, the expressive and the friction type sound, which is maybe even more um, the most uncanny of all. So this is like on page 89, uh, where he's sitting there, uh, hidden in the curtain uh, in, a, in a closet. The footsteps thudded nearer and nearer. There was a strange coughing, rasping, and growling in, in, inside. I mean, all of the, uh, these are all examples. These are examples, actually, coughing, growling, and uh, rasping are sort of examples of, of expressive sounds that are also frictional sounds, where, where the frictional element sort of uh, dominates over the maybe the expressive kind, but it's also, and, and that's probably what makes them also uh, somewhat animal, animalistic there, because of the the expressivity is uh, so physical and, and corporeal there. Uh, my heart quaked with fear and, and anticipation. Close, close behind the door, a quick footstep, a violent blow on the latch. The door sprang open with a clatter. Taking my courage in both hands, I peer cautiously out. Oh, yeah, I have to add that um, in the German, uh, this is all in the present tense. He's describing this. And it's, uh, I'll come back to that later on, but there's a tendency in sort of polite uh, discourse in the, to put everything in the past tense. And it, it changes, obviously, a lot. In fact, that's uh, very often in, in connection with Freud's book on jokes, uh, there's a lot of speculation about why the, his, his jokes either aren't funny or, or don't work in the English translation. And the, the people say, well, it's this sort of untranslatable Yiddish uh, jokes that he's telling and so on. Uh, untranslatable, my eye. Uh, Freud is telling these jokes in, in German in the present. And if you ever have told a joke, I hope you've told it in the present, because you make a story out of it by making it once upon a time, uh, it, it doesn't work. You know, it yeah. becomes a story, and it's not a joke anymore. Like, uh, and what they did, but uh, the, the present tense in story, in that kind of discourse, is considered non-new. It's considered sort of low, low level. It's not, you don't have enough distance from it. And so the, the, the academic Bloomsbury translators of Freud uh, decided to put his jokes into the, into the past, like the once upon, and they become stories, but they're not very good as jokes anymore. And that's the main reason why you know, they, uh, they, they, uh, they don't work. And here it's a sort of a similar thing. It's considered a little bit uh, you know, too immediate, too, too crude to tell it in the present tense, you know? And so it's put into the past tense, and it loses, not consistently, but, but there, for example, you know, uh, if you, instead of I peer, I peer cautiously out, I peered cautiously out. You see, if, you're, if you put it in the past tense, there's a difference. The narrator is already, uh, you know, beyond, of course, he is telling the story in the past, 
but it, it's, it's much more effective when even thinking about it, he lapses into the present. It shows that the past memory is present for him. It isn't just put on, it isn't safely ensconced as something that he has distance from. Isn't that called story tense as well? Isn't there a thing called story the, tense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the, the, the imperfect or something. And, uh, and, uh, but as I say, for in the jokes, doesn't, they aren't told that way. Either. Would you say that yes. if you tell a joke in the past tense, that's when uh, it becomes dry? Like a dry yeah, sentence? that's what I, yeah. In okay. other words, uh, uh, the, the mechanism of the joke, which depends on a, uh, an amount of surprise, but also being drawn into it in a certain okay. way, is much, much more effective if you tell a joke in, 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 in okay. the present than in the, than in the, in the past. And, uh, and so when you read these things in the past, it becomes a story but it, it can't have that sort of sudden turn. Okay. That, that well, it can if you don't pretense it as a joke. If I see. You lead the, yeah. Yeah, like but if a, you announce it a joke yeah. and then you tell it as a story, okay. then it tends to be very stilted. You know, it tends to be very stable, very, very staid, yeah. and so on. Uh, so if you ever do read Freud's book on jokes and the unconscious, uh, you know, if you can, try to retranslate the jokes as you're reading into into the present or work better or, or, <laughs> or something like that. Um, an example, I don't know if it will work here, but uh, since I've already announced it, but uh, uh, he tells this joke, he says, uh, two Jews meet in front of a bathhouse, and one says, you didn't take a bath, did you? And the other says, why, is one missing? <laughs> and so if you say that, you know, two Jews, two Jews ran into each other in front of the bathhouse, and one said, uh, you didn't take a bath, and I said, why, so... It, it it works much mm -hmm. less uh, less effectively. There are a whole bunch of jokes, you know, that are, that, that that are like that. And Freud tells him in the present. He doesn't doubt about that and so on. But the, the, the translations and but it's as I say, it, it, uh, what that shows is that the, tra the the sort of academically respectable translation wants a certain distance between itself and the and 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 uh, the story. Let's say. And you know what this is all. About, what this this scene is about is that is that Nathaniel also wants a certain distance, a distance where he can safely be a spectator. And at a certain point, he can't. That distance collapses, you know, and it collapses in a very interesting way. He's drawn into the scene at his own risk and peril. You see, and uh, and and that's when you know he's then taken over by the, the by the Copelius, by the Sandman, and and so on. But in other words, physically, then he, uh, he 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 can't he can't keep his position hidden in the in the closet there, and and it's actually he's not discovered because he's discovered, but because he he jumps out, you know, he's too excited, and and uh, there. but he jumps out in a very interesting way when we get to the uh, uh, a very interesting word that's used there, again that doesn't quite come across in in the English translation, although it could. I came up with a pretty good translation of it that's not used, of course. Uh, and so one other point here, in, in the, in Hoff, the Hoffman story uh, is trying to recreate a certain rhythm of immediacy, not just by the tenses, but by the fact that he repeats certain words like, softly, softly, I open the door, of uh, 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 there. He, at various times, uh, certain words are repeated. Uh, they are close, close behind the door. And then he uses a dash, a quick footstep, a violent blow on the latch. The door springs open with a clatter. That's the way it is in the German. Not and the door spring sprang open. See the difference? Uh, one is uh, uh, tack, 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 like that. And you don't have that. The other is, uh, it, this is the way it happened, folks. Uh, you know, you're safe behind your curtain. And so, and, and so, so basically, the position of the spectator, as reader, as spectator, is, is not in the German the way it is in the, uh, as, as much. Uh, there, but again, you see the sounds that are being produced: a footstep, a, a violent blow on the latch. These are all, you know, fictional sounds, or even more. You know, I don't know what the word is, but the basic idea that they're produced by colliding bodies in some sense or surfaces, mm -hmm. and not primarily or only or essentially by expression. And where is by expression, as with coughing, rasping, and so on, the frictional element? Is, is in a way more important than the volitional continuum one. It's not like you're expressing a, a, a voice or something like that. There's no control, uh, isn't the same kind of control there. Uh, so the, uh, and then the Sandman, the terrible Sandman, you see again this repetition, was the aged advocate, lawyer, Coppelius, who sometimes came 
to lunch with us. Again, all in the present. You've got to re rewrite this as you read it. And it's, it's not who sometimes uh, came to lunch with us. Here is an amazing play in German that's absolutely uh, untranslatable. I have to sort of write it there. Uh, the Sandman, he says, is, not the is, in German is, is. Okay? The Sandman is the aged lawyer who eats with us at lunch. Now, the word for eats in German is almost the same as is, is, is. <coughs> See? And so you get a repetition there that isn't identical, but where the is of the Sandman becomes the eats. In the in the present indicative, as you're reading it, there there you see, and that that's a, I think that's quite powerful, quite a powerful effect, it, and it also says you know what is the relation between the the is the being of the Sandman and the the eating, uh, the devouring or the and you know and the meal there of course is quite a nightmare for uh, for for Nathaniel. The other thing that has never been, to my knowledge, remarked on, is the name. The name Coppelius, the name has been remarked on, particularly in connection later with, with, the, with, the, with the double uh, Coppola. Coppola in Italian uh, means eye socket. So uh, there's, there's a clear connection, you know, between, uh, there. But Coppola, C-O-P-P-O-L-A, and Coppelius are also similar to another word, which actually has never been, to my knowledge, noted, probably because what it designates is not a, a visible object. But something in this context even more important. <laughs> you know what that is? A copula? Yeah. It's this. Is the cop in other words, S is P. If you do you know logical is P. The Sandman is Copaius or whatever. The is or is is the copula in the in the sentence. Right? It it couples. It couples the subject with the predicate. It allows identification, you know, to take place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, it's it's uh, worth remarking that the name of Copelius Cop Copula is also very close to the copula, which is the same in German, with a K and so on, copula, and which is it's all about what he's trying to discover here, and which is problematized by this play of is is and is eats. In other words. The copula normally is what allows you to make a predication, a proposition, that is stable. You know, so this is that, that is a, a film camera, this is a diva, and so on. That's what enables you to sort of feel stable and reassured in the world. It sets up a kind of is. It isn't necessarily an existential is. It isn't, doesn't tell you a thing about reality, but it at least allows you to link up, uh, you know, a, a subject with a predicate, and therefore to, uh, you know, make a certain identification there. Uh, so, in a certain sense, the problem is precisely the copula. The copula was the, the you could almost say, and, and in addition, Copelius is a lawyer. Copula is an, uh, and Copa Coppola is an, an eyeglass, you know, maker of, of, of uh, prostheses, visual prostheses. Uh, today, he'd be a seller of uh, flat screen TVs and stuff like that, you know, stuff that enables you to sort of see the world better than you can see with your own limited physical vision. You need your brain, it increases it. And uh, so all of these functions, uh, and, and the lawyer as well, have to, are, are, can be related to the, to the coupling, the coupling uh, function of the, co of the copula, you see. They're all sort of brought into play there, uh, particularly with, you know, how with the lawyer. Now it's true, it, 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 it's not said much about, practically nothing is said about his actual professional function as a lawyer. So it's really, but it is mentioned there, you see. And he's a very strange lawyer, to be sure, you know. You don't, but uh, there is something, you know, Hoffman himself practiced law, and so he's well aware of that. Now law is, involves something similar to the copula function. Why? Because the, the, the function of the lawyer is to take law, which is general, which therefore has the status of a predicate, and to apply it to a particular or singular case. That's what the, and that has to be done through advocare, through, through ad advocating. There's nothing, the law itself can't apply itself to a specific case. The law must be applied by the institutions, and that, that's where the advocate 
uh, in, in Durman and, and so on, the lawyer, you know, comes in, in, into the picture. So uh, Coppelius, as advocate, as lawyer, is, is situated in a number of different ways in this problematic uh, juncture, as it were, between uh, uh, a singular and, and general universal law and case, uh, uh, subject and predicate, and uh, Coppola will, uh, his double, uh, will um, associate that with a certain type of vision, but a vision that has to be assisted. It isn't enough to have just your eye, because your eyes, are, uh, precisely here, are uh, a sign more of vulnerability and of possible deception for Descartes, for Luther, for whoever, uh, Plato also. Uh, and so they need to be assisted by telescopes, uh, lenses of all kinds, and so on. And today, this is, this is uh, Hoffman's early critique and th of the media, of, the, of the, 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 the televisual media, where we see things that we otherwise you know, couldn't see. And the way you know, the, uh, most people depend on what they see in those televisual media for their sense of reality, much more than they may realize, but certainly enor enormously. Enormously, and you know why? Because you're dealing obviously with a, a reality that is global, that is highly complex, that's removed. You can't possibly take that all in with your own two eyes. But nevertheless, and that's what the, this is the interesting aspect. Uh, uh, when you watch television, it's as if you were watching with your own two eyes. You are watching the television screen with your own two eyes, but what's being presented to you, obviously, is is, is something else again. You see, and. Uh, um, uh, the tension between needing, not just wanting, but needing to believe that one can make reliable, definitive judgments through what one sees, and of course hears, but mainly sees, um, uh, is what uh, creates this, this uh, love-hate but very profound dependency relation on the televisual uh, me media. <coughs> in fact, I, I probably may have mentioned this already, but if I look back on the last 30 or 40 years in the U.S. at least, and, and probably elsewhere as well, uh, and, uh, it seems to me that the, some of the most fundamental changes that have taken place have been as a result of the gr ever-growing power of the televisual media in the political process in, and in every other way. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, that seems to me really to be absolutely uh, decisive there. So in a way... Uh, um, what you're getting in a story like this is a, is a, a, a more tortured, uh, problematic awareness of the fact that uh, the, f the physical senses require technological assistance and media that can be highly unreliable and even threatening. And here you get a, an actual threat to you know to the body. Uh, 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 focused around the eyes, but also connected with uh, a hearing and with touch. It's as if the uh, uh, the and and it's interesting the way this uh, uh, the way this is portrayed. You'll notice that the description of uh, many things, including the father and Coppelius and so on, is on the cusp of a transitional period because it's constantly being said uh, Coppelius is, is dressed in old-fashioned clothes, my father was old-fashioned. In other words, there's a sense of being at a turning point. The old is still there, but it's already becoming something different. Now, he makes an, he, uh, that's not absolutely necessary for the story, it seems, but it is important. It adds, it adds an important dimension to it that he says, you know, uh, when he goes on to describe him, he mentions that he's you know, wearing, and uh, Coppelius always appeared in an ash, ash gray coat of old-fashioned cut. And you know, he constantly emphasizes he, that he's old-fashioned uh, uh, there, and he's, he's not, you know, he's not cool. And uh, at the same time, the description then is, that, he, that he then gives you, um, ha finally having seen who this, this Sandman is, it's no longer anonymous, uh, is uh, that of a de of a deformed body, you know, de misshapen head, and then the color plays a big role: the ochre yellow face, uh, gray bushy eyebrows, from under which a pair of green cat's eyes blaze out piercingly. Uh, that blaze out piercing piercingly is important. It's a, a an attempt to render in English a kind of sparkling projection 
that he describes in German is as if the, again the eyes are already bulging out of the they're, they're go, go, bulging out of their sockets. You see, and uh, it's as if uh, the form of the human body, as epitomized in the figure of Coppelius, is already anticipating the kind of bodily dismemberment that Coppelius will do, and that will then go on and set the stage for the remembering of the automaton, which is perfectly regular, Olympia, and so on, and then which is pulled apart by the two in this, uh, uh, in, in, in this struggle and so on. So it's as if, you know, here the sense of the body, uh, it's a turning point. The body has, for a certain point, been regarded as something that is organically whole, but it doesn't work like that anymore. It's pushing out at all at all extremes, it's losing its form, it's deforming itself, and in a very aggressive way, in a way that mixes animal and human uh, with the uh, uh, gray, bushy eyebrows, and piercingly is important, blaze out, p uh, uh, piercingly large, heavy nose, and so on. Uh, two dark red blotches appearing on the sea, and a strange, so you have color being used in a way to suggest, again, a kind of a bloody, and the blood close to the surface there in some sense. And then a strange hissing sound comes from between the clenched teeth. That again is a sort of quintessential mixture of expressive and frictional uh, sound that I'm talking about there. But you see, it's, it, it's strange and threatening because it isn't just expressive. That's what makes it animalistic. It's like a cat that's getting ready to pounce, you know, it hisses. Uh, before it were found, says between clenched teeth, the teeth are are, are tight, you know, t uh, together, and then uh, um, uh, his little wig uh, hardly covered more than the crown of his head. Rolls of hair stood high over his big red ears. A broad, discolored hair bag stuck out at the back of his neck. Neck. Uh, Freud will put a lot of emphasis, obviously, on what he calls the castration complex, castration anxiety as related to this. And I think up to a point that's perfectly descriptively justified. Uh, the, the, because the, you get in the description of Coppelius and then later on, the strange mixture of, of a kind of animal power associated with all kinds of erections, protuberances, things you know, going out of, their, uh, out of their, their, their limits, as it were, sticking out of all kinds there. And uh, at the same time, while, while that represents some sort of power, it also represents a threat, a threat precisely to the unity of the body. And that's precisely what castration anxiety is, you know, in a way involves, something that both involves a power of the body but also uh, a mutilation, you know, uh, of, of the body there. Uh, uh, there. Um, so you get that, and then uh, what we children, next page, what we children found repugnant above all were his great knotty hair-covered hands. And we lost all liking for anything he touched with them. You see, here's where you have almost a kind of synthesis of a certain perception of this deformity, this deformed monster, this deformed body. And at the same time, the use of color and the use of sound, this hissing sound. And it all comes together in uh, uh, the fact that there's no separation anymore, that uh, he, uh, this, is not, this, uh, this is going to, con to spread itself by contagion to everything that's around it, you know, so that already the, there's no way of distancing yourself from it. It's the, the touching of the hands and the hairy hands and so on that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, in, in a way embody this, already this violence. Of course, later on he's going to use those hands to tear the body apart and, 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 and uh, so on. So I think it's a very, very, very powerful and suggestive, you know, it's very significant uh, description here. And, he, and, and at the same time, it's very interesting is that uh, Coppelius is totally, seems to be totally in control of what he's doing. The, the father is totally passive, the mother, is not, the kids are not allowed to speak. Coppelius knows exactly what he's doing and takes you know, sadistic pleasure in doing it. So he says he loves to, he reached over quickly with his hands uh, uh, and touched, uh, touched the glass to his blue lips and laughed, laughed devilishly. When the mother tries to pass on something to the children, Capetius's hand comes in between and sort of, you know, contaminates it for, you know, for, uh, for them. Uh, and so that then produces the idea of repulsion, something that will be very, very important for Nietzsche, the idea of 
discussed and, 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 and I don't want to you know, talk too much about this today. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, bodily ejections of all kinds. as kind of re revolt, a physical kind of, of uh, rejection there. Uh, there, but... Uh, uh, um, so all and this is all a memory. In other words, he sees Copelius and he remembers this this lunch scene, basically around the lunch table, which is normally a reassuring moment when the family collects themselves and and communicates or communes in one way. And then it, it, there's this figure. You know why why is the figure there? That's the thing. See, uh, why is there no door to keep him out? Why, what is, what what gives him the power over the father? You know, despite the mother uh, being being uh, and and that's something that is never. Uh, explained explicitly, but there's certainly a lot of suggestions that are there. That there's some, you know, sort of uh, passionate connection there, uh, some power, erotic power that uh, that, that Copelius has in connection with the father, uh, which uh, uh, then comes out in the uh, when they start working in this alchemical scene there. You know, there uh, uh, you get. A, a, um, Good God, as this is on page 91, as my old father bent down to the fire, he looked quite different. A dreadful convulsive pain seemed to have distorted his gentle, honest features into a repulsive devil mask. He looked like Copelius. Now, uh, it's very interesting there because there's going to be a series of identifications throughout this story, uh, fine, leading up to a final... Uh, uh, disastrous, in a way, identification, but which fit in somewhat to the this Lacanian model of the narcissistic ego being built on identification with an image of the other, that uh, uh, which at the same time tries to deny the otherness of the image. Depends on the otherness of the image, the difference of it from oneself, but also tries to deny it, and is in an absolute double bind as a result. This is a kind of... And uh, something like that is, is uh, there are identifications all over, and particularly uh, here, for example, that the father, who is on the one hand very different from Copelius, who's passive, uh, feminine almost, you could say, compared to Copelius, who's masculine and active, but at the same time looks like Copelius. And then uh, there are constantly spasms and convulsions being described, always in a painful way, but it's not very, you know, uh, uh, not very uh, easy to separate that from also some sign of orgiastic, orgasmic uh, uh, pleasure that's also painful uh, there. And the reason that it's painful is that inevitably in, in this context, uh, which is that of, the, of an imaginary ego identification, narcissistic ego identification, is leading to the, uh, to the destruction of the, the, the ego. To, as a, in other words, the ego wants to retain a certain wholeness but in the process of identification, uh, has to, in, in some involuntary way, acknowledge that uh, it is not whole, and and that t and yet can't accept that, and so it takes the form of this these fantasies of dismemberment, uh, which are also, but they have to be seen as they're described always as painful, but there must be something like pleasure involved, uh, or there's some constraint there. And it's never, you know, it's, although it's never really explained why, what the power that Copelius has, it comes out in the relation, to, in, the, in Nathaniel's relation to Olympia, which is sort of the same thing. Nathaniel has to flee from Clara because Clara represents for him a castrated body, uh, death. Death looks at him through Clara's uh, uh, eyes, and instead he seeks solace in the uh, in the image of the feminine that would be. Uh, complete, but that's an automaton. That's totally like. In other words, uh, the automaton in Olympia is death in life, death posing as life, or not death, but is never alive. But uh, it is actually, since he believes that she's alive, but it's uh, at, uh, uh, but uh, it's also a perfect image. Whereas when he sees Clara, he sees uh, death, he sees uh, destruction, and so on. Uh, 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 there, yeah. Could the uh, dismemberment be sort of uh, pleasurable in the sense that it's a release from fear? Because if you have a fear of dismemberment and then are dismembered, then although you have lost that which you like, you no longer have the fear of losing it. It's a good, very good question. It, it, it could, uh, but it, it isn't in this story. Okay. And, the, and so the question is, you know, why, why, and I think it's because the kind of self-identity that 
Nathaniel and that is, 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 is committed to having does not allow that, does not allow the ego to uh, accept that kind of abandonment. In other words, you could, re you could see the same problem with Nietzsche. And Nietzsche is sort of arguing for a kind of pleasure in escaping from uh, a certain type of, of, of notion of totality and wholeness and so on. Uh, so, you know, for example, Nietzsche is also talking about uh, convulsions. And, for example, in the uh, Birth of Tragedy, he talks about St. Vitus' dance and about the dances in the Middle Ages and so on, the Dionysian. And uh, uh, for, for Nietzsche, he sees that as, in fact, uh, 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 also a source of, of, of ecstasy. You know, that's very important uh, uh, to, uh, to him. Uh, but, but he does that then by creating a, you know, an, a, an antipode to it, which is the, the Apollinian. That, so he has the two there that has to mediate there. But Nietzsche is someone who is much, much more interested precisely in the, the overcoming of this kind of identity. identity. But uh, that's not the case with, with uh, that's being described here, you see. And so, it, uh, so you know, you're absolutely right. That, uh, and this is what interests me, is to try to analyze as much as possible what are the different options open to something like an ego? How can an ego be structured so as to allow something like a fantasy of dismemberment to be not just totally self-destructive, you see? That, that is, I think, a really key question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a question being posed, been posed artistically. You know, in the 20s, you have uh, Hans Bellmeier, uh, with his, uh, the, the Puppa, the, the, and so on, the doll, or, and so on. And there's a constant, you know, fascination with puppets, and automaton, and, and uh, automata, and so on. But uh, uh, in a certain Western tradition, perhaps Western, you know, post-Reformation tradition, it's very hard to... Uh, to disassociate the, uh, the ego from the hope of grace, if you see what I mean. And my, my question would be, to what extent does this hope of grace, does this horizon of possible grace, even though it's, uh, you know, is that responsible for this uh, kind of anxiety that uh, makes it impossible to experience the other as anything other but a threat, or as fundamentally a threat? And you would say that's because experiencing the other is sort of some kind of sin? It's, is that what you mean? It's certainly associated okay. with it. I mean, he, I mean, the, the, the figure of, you know, Coppelius here is certainly that of a, of, a, of a kind of devil, of a sin. So, yeah, so it is. But the basis of it is that the, the because the eye is already sinful, already fallen, is already part is caught up in a fallen existence. It's defined through, uh, through with respect to being fallen, that it, the other is a mirror of that, <coughs> mirrors that. You see, it, and, and so the question is whether you know something like the fall, the original <coughs> sin, defining some, the relation of life and death in those terms, let's say, uh, is not you know part of the problem. That that is what at this point what I'm you know asking, what I'm what I'm wondering about. If you see what I mean, mm -hmm. that that would be that that's. Uh, that I mean, well, in, inevitably, that's an irresolvable problem. It sort of it becomes almost like a dialectic. Right? Yeah, but you see, for example, if you read, let's say, uh, as I was referring this morning, like Moses and monotheism, Moses and monotheism, you know, there you don't have. I mean, Freud is sort of uh, not even ironically, but he's describing a relationship which doesn't have an absolute beginning, which doesn't have a beginning in. An absolute, you know, where self identity is not the beginning and end, the horizon of the, the, of the process, but rather uh, a kind of openness, a kind of heterogeneity is the way I would call it there. Uh, so that changes things. You see, that, that means that every constitution of identity is necessarily includes some sort of violence, but it doesn't have to be self destructive violence or destructive of the other. Well, then, destructive to what? Uh, this, this violent in the sense of imposing a certain order uh, from the outside that always is never complete. That is never, is never uh, see, in the sense of being a violation, I sort of, there, that's not an etymological connection, but it's one that I make when I think of, you know, violence being that which is, which something owes its identity to something outside of itself. But not that something, but that other is not conceived of as being 
in and of itself self-identical, being the same. So that, so that leaves it open. Uh, it's not even a question of faith and knowledge, if you know what I mean, because faith and knowledge both can be defined in a way that presuppose self-identity. I believe in, and then you, I, I may not know it, but I believe in something, that in a, a, a creator God that is a, a monotheistic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I believe in an absolute origin. I believe in an original purity. And so, see, all of that presupposes some sort of, of, of original self-identity. When Freud says we don't know, you know, that's very different. That means we don't know. I mean, it's saying, look, uh, I, I'm not going to give you uh, a proposition that will eliminate all anxiety you might have about the future and the past. You're, we have to live with a certain uncertainty and a certain openness there, but it also means that you relate then differently to risk, to danger, and to so on, as, you know, when they're confronted, right. uh, when you confront them. So almost like the way that it's sort of symbolic and the symbolic has changed and the fact that you have um, symbols which seem to govern uh, the, the use of and the existence of humanity in, in terms of um, exchangeability of symbols, the idea that you can communicate. I mean, that in a certain sense is already an imposition on us, right? right? So it becomes, it's yeah. almost like, you know, that's in a modern context, of course. It, uh, I mean, one of the things that Benjamin is doing in this, for me, very important book on the origin of the German morning play is to define a form of symbolization which he calls allegory. And which he distinguishes from another, it depends how something points away. Basically, he, uh, he argues there that, that the symbolic uh, presupposes uh, some sort of access to the symbolized, some sort of sense of what it is and some sort of ultimately self-identity. Whereas he says that what emerges in the crisis of the post-Reformation Europe is, um, is a signifier that... Um, uh, 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 in a, that problematizes conventional agreement on meaning, and in that sense is always open to another another explanation. He says, you know, and, and that, he calls that allegory. You know, he says <coughs> allegory is a representation of the non-being of what is represented, or something, or the the otherness of what's represented. You see, and so it's very interesting there because he, he is. Um, it seems there that he's gravitating toward a different type of symbolization, if you will. Because the symbol is often understood as a kind of imminence. When you look in the books of rhetoric and so on, uh, uh, the lion, you know, just as, as a kind of royal symbol, basically is based on, a, on a, a predicate that is shared at both ends of the symbol. The lion has power and then the, the ruler has power, so, or, so, or courage, or something like that. And so it's based on universals. Whereas allegory, the way Benjamin is describing it, tries to take account of the, the, of the, the, the difference of singular situations. And therefore, it's never in that sense imminent, totally imminent. It always is open. And it, it, what it does, uh, uh, Benjamin has a very interesting phrase there. He says, uh, the, way I'm, the way he's describing Baroque allegory, it's not, uh, doesn't invite, it's not simply conventional meaning, which is often the way allegory is understood. There's a very fixed conventional meaning and it's being used, this means that. It, it, it actually involves calling into question the meaning of convention. In other words, uh, symbols are being used in, in a way that uh, cannot be exhaustively accounted for by their conventional meaning. What that does, among other things, is not just to open up questions, but also to open up the question of what is it involved in a convention. And a, a convention literally is a convenio, a coming together. And it's inevitable, it's necessary, that we can't, you know, there'll be no communication or language without convince some sort of conventional uh, you know, agreement. But the status of the convention, that is where the, you know, does the convention derive from some divine or transcendent uh, authority, or is it uh, itself you know, evidence of, the, of, of uh, an interplay of desire, anxiety, and so on, that, that necessarily produces meanings, but in an always open and tentative way, in some sense, you see. And the convention is always seen, it's almost links right back to this, because, I mean, the, the convention needs to be applied in the same way that the lawyer needs to apply the law to something. The Precisely. To, to a singular. Absolutely. And what's also very unique about ben, Benjamin's particular use of that is that he connects it to theater. It's a staging. You see, because there's something involved in staging in which you appeal to conventions, but in order to have a powerful staging, and even Aristotle is aware of this, there have to be surprises. There have to be divergence from the... From, and it gets a social process. It involves a collective. You don't just do it 
uh, by yourself, you see. Um, and, you know, for example, so Nietzsche is very, very aware of this, of the men who doesn't appeal to him. Nietzsche says, maybe the Greeks created the gods so that they would have spectators for their suffering, and that would give their suffering meaning, or something like that. So Nietzsche is very, very aware of theatricality uh, being, in some sense, necessary, uh, but in order to, uh, for example, to make suffering bearable or to uh, create a possibility of meaning, but always tentative, because there's always a creation there. Uh, the audience is necessary, but the audience is, is never uh, uh, transcendentally fixed, if you see what I mean. You're not, the, although that's what the Greeks, you know, with the gods as spectators may have wanted to do, but that's not what Nietzsche is thinking. You know, he, he, he says that's a, a, you know, a social strategy. And the, the permanence of an audience like the gods would therefore allow for almost the, the origins of sort of like the, the set signifiers to exist, right? Absolutely. So because then the gods always watch, it's always the same because there's always the static audience. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so what's interesting, one of the things that's interesting here is to come to this question of audience. I mean, what, is an audience merely a spectator? That is, to what extent is an audience detached? And certainly one of the big tendencies uh, in, let's say, modern thinking and aesthetics and so on in the last two or three hundred years has been to emphasize the fact that the audience is involved, is a participant. It's not, you know, but that doesn't mean the audience is identical with the, with the stage. The audience is separate from the stage, but also defines the stage, because there is, that plays to the audience, and at the same time, it partakes in it in, a, in, a, in, in one way or another, not by playing the roles, but by responding as a responder and as a transmitter and, and so on. Now, uh, what we get here is, is, is interesting. Uh, you know, at the end of this, this uh, not the end of this scene, but the, the, you get him describing, he's, he's a spectator. He looked like, you know, describing what's happening. Uh, he looked like Coppelius. The latter, Coppelius sees, this is page 91, sees the glowing tongs, and with them drew brightly gleaming substances out of the thick black smoke and began vigorously to hammer away at them. I seemed to see human faces appearing all around, but without eyes. Instead of eyes, there were hideous black cavities. And so he, you have to get the scene here. He's hidden. He's a hidden spectator looking at eyes being wrenched out of bodies, hammered, and you know, uh, and uh, using his own eyes to see that, you know, and to, to, to take that in and be and terrified, at, you know, at that. And the Copenius, eyes, bring eyes, he cries in a dull, hollow voice. I mean, he really is a musician. Uh, you, know, he, uh, you know, it's a really important that, he, that the voice be hollow. You know, a hollow uh, there's nothing more interesting than hollow sounds. You know, particularly in non-Western uh, music, you have a lot of that, and you know, gourds. And so I don't know if we think we have that much of it in, in, in Western music, but it's very, very important in, in, in uh, Asian music and so on, the, the use of hollows hollow sound. Why? Because it, you know, it, it um, again, mixes up this uh, opposition that is very, very uh, fundamental for a lot of Western culture, which is of an opposition between inside and outside. In a, in a hollow gourd uh, or hollow voice, the outside is inside. And you, know, you see what I mean? The container contains, you know, nothing. But that nothing becomes a space of resonance. So it isn't just nothing there. Um, so, um, gripped by wild terror, now, I screamed aloud. <clears throat> so this is too much for him. It, 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 you know, and I think in, in the German, unfortunately, I don't have here, it's more like, it screamed out of me. You can say that. In, 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 it broke out of me, and that kind of thing. Uh, like, you know, in, in, in German, until fairly recently, you could say, it dreamt me, rather than I dreamt. Es träumte mir. And that is, although it's bizarre in English, probably a much more accurate description of the dream than when you say, I had a dream. What, it, you know, what does it mean, I had a dream? You, know, you certainly didn't, you don't have it under your control, right? But at the same time, it's, it's more intimate to you than anything you could control. I mean, that's the, par I think of that, if you think of that paradox, then you'll see you know, that this is really uh, not just abstract, but uh, something that is uh, conscious, alien to your self-consciousness, can be more intimately involved in, in your being uh, than something that is, you know, totally controllable by your uh, self-consciousness. Uh, 
and I think we, you know, this is what we experience all over the place in different forms of art, and and and, and, and so on. You know, the, the, uh, this now there's um, the the translation that I don't like, although it's an evidence. I screamed aloud and fell out of my hiding place onto the floor. Um, uh, it's as if the English has to make the choice between active or passive. You know, say either I jumped out, which he doesn't say, or I fell out, in which he's you know, but Hoffman finds a word in German, and this time there is a word in English that I have been able to find, and the word is plunge. Mm -hmm. I plunge in German it's Stutz, you know. And now mm -hmm. plunge is really interesting because you can't really say whether it's not clearly passive or active. Mm -hmm. You know, you say I took a plunge, then it becomes active, but if I, I plunged, it's open. You know, did you do it voluntarily? Did you? Uh, and that's very, you know, that is very important for this. In other words, it's an eye that becomes an agent of an action that it doesn't simply control or, or author, as it were. He's responding here to, uh, and of course, later on, the whole debate with Clara will revolve around what is the power of the self-conscious eye to, you know, control these demons and these fears and these, you know, fantasies that he, that, that, that he has and so on. But that's why, so you know, I, I screamed aloud and plunged from my hiding place onto the floor. And Coppelius seizes him and so on, and grasps him, and father, you know, begs him to keep his eyes. And then what he does is, okay, the boy can keep his eyes, but now let's observe the mechanism of the hands and feet. And with that, he sees me so violently that my joints cracked, unscrewed my hands and feet, and fixed them on again now, in this way, now that. They don't look right anywhere, better where they were. The old one knew what he was doing. Coppelius lisped and hissed. Everything went dark around me. A sudden spasm shot through my frame. You know, it's really hard not, I think you can't separate that from a kind of orgasm of some sort, even if it's painful. And, and, uh, but the point is, um, uh, the important part of it is that it's a, it's a convulsion that is not under the control of the ego uh, as a self-conscious uh, uh, ego, uh, spasm, and it involves the, 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 the rearranging of the organs, you know, and then he finally puts them back together with it, but he calls the deity the old one, and this is, you know, this is, I think, part of the, the indication of why uh, Coppelius and why everything is a bit old-fashioned here, because this is really a confrontation with an old-fashioned but still very powerful commitment to a certain type of theological identity of I uh, that's no longer working, that's confronted with technology, that's confronted with other you know, desires and anxieties, and nevertheless doesn't let go its force, you see. And, uh, so, yeah, uh, go ahead. This is, a, uh, this is not saying that he's an automaton. Well, he's a uh, yes and no. Yes and no, yeah. I mean, it's so a fantasy of... Me? It's the only reference to him potentially being automaton. Right. In the text. Except uh, that's right. Except the thing with his with the eyes being you know plucked out and so on. No, you're absolutely right. But but uh, it, um, what's you're right. But it's 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 in between the sense of the body as an organic whole and the sense of the body as a mechanical assemblage. You see. But what's what I think is interesting is that the sense of the body as mechanical assemblage is associated with a certain type of desire, anxiety, and passion. You see, which is uh, it's not, and, and that's that's what makes uh, eroticism uh, dangerous and subversive. You see, it's not some sort of abstract morality. It's the fact that it uh, eroticism calls into question the the conventional model of ego identity uh, by regarding the body as an assemblage of potential ero erogenous zones, as Freud might say, you see, uh, which each are pulling in, in, in their own direction and don't necessarily uh, come into a uh, form a whole. In other words, there's a very uh, interesting article by La Planche and Pontalis, I think it is, on fantasy of origins, origins of the fantasy. I, ha I have the, the text here. I can actually bring it, bring it in. And what they this is from way back in the 70s, I think. Very, very illuminating. And what they argue there 
is that Freud makes a distinction that he himself doesn't necessarily keep to between autoeroticism and narcissism. And that the autoeroticism is a pre-narcissistic stage for, for Freud, if you think of it chronologically. And what it's organized around independent uh, erogenous zones, as he puts it, which are generally connected with orifices, with great you know, mouth, anus, and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, do not imply, imply pleasure and desire, but don't imply wholeness. That's why they're, they're, they're pre-narcissistic, since by narcissistic is meant the image of a body as a whole, forming the basis for the sense of the ego as a whole. Something that, you know, where you're, you're one. Everything is where it should be, and, and you are a whole, just as your body is, is felt to be a whole. From this point of view, this is speaking to your question again, you see. From, from this point of view, that of a narcissistic ego, any tampering, any uh, even, uh, you know, uh, as they would say, any libidinal investment in, in erogenous zones can be threatening, because it threatens the sense of the body as uh, a whole. Uh, 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 there, you see, this is why the, uh, and uh, um, uh, this is, this is uh, the, how to put it, the, the problematizing of ego identity that is going on, uh, uh, psychologically at least, is, and corporally is, involves a shift in the, in the experience of the body as something that is, a, is you know, a whole, an organic whole, uh, and, and uh, something that is um, uh, 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 an, an instrument of pleasure, and that which doesn't necessarily have to follow the demands of wholeness, if you, if you see what I mean there. So, uh, 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 although there isn't much, you know, in this story there's, there's practically no direct pleasure. It's all uh, described as painful, but... Well, it, except his gaze at Olympia. Pardon me? His gaze at Olympia. That's true. Absolutely right, but that's of course in a way the furthest from this kind of uh, erogenous. Uh, that's the fantasy of uh, an erotic object that would be uh, an organic body, but that ironically is a, is an automaton. See, so the the in a way the the culmination of his of his, in the positive culmination of his fantasy is the worst nightmare in a certain sense because he's in love there with. Uh, an automaton as a uh, thinking that it's a, a living, a living being, and the living being Clara is for him death. You know, is a threat, is a threat to his uh, to his unity, to his sense of self. Uh, so it's a sort of a delusional gaze. Yeah. So uh, uh, right, right. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's also very, you know, very interesting also how this uh, fits in, this, this overlaps then these senses with the, the sense of uh, uh, a certain type of, tech, tech, of technology, the, the, the mechanics of the body as, uh, uh, as an assemblage of organs, thing that Deleuze will, will you know, later write about and so on, uh, fascination with the, uh, um, the, the, the non-holistic aspects of the uh, of the body, but in in this case, it's always a source of terror and, and and danger because it seems that you know the at the same time that it's a source of desire. In other words, what you have to I think assume is that uh, Nathaniel is driven by desire and fear, and uh, not just by fear and not just by desire, and it's uh, uh, otherwise there it wouldn't be this this and his father already. That's something that he inherits. As it were, from uh, you know, from from his his father, the power of Capelius over his father has something to do with the fascination, the erotic fascination of what Capelius is doing uh, for uh, uh, for a male libido, if you will, or for a, for a father there, and so on. Uh, it's certainly not because Capelius is a beautiful uh, love object or something like that uh, 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 there. So um, it's a little bit like you know the, 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 the relation of the house father to Adredek, which is uh, not nearly as obviously violent, but where there's also this fascination with everything that at the same time eludes his grasp. And here there's a revulsion, a, re, a repugnancy, but there's also uh, 
uh, an undercurrent, I think, of, of, uh, of, of cap captivity in something, or you know, being captured by, by this and so on. Um, any, 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 any other uh, sort of, you know, remarks on, on, on this so far? Uh, let's move ahead then to uh, his uh, the way some of the consequences of this. Uh, uh, his father then uh, is killed in this explosion that 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 takes place against them uh, in there uh, somehow connected with with uh, with Galerius. and um, uh, what's interesting then is his. Uh, the way this the way this is situated in between sort of uh, the enlightenment and uh, a kind of romantic sense that the enlightenment is inadequate is inadequate to, ex to 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 deal with these drives and 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 and, and uh, desires and fears that are involved so clara is obviously connected with what you call a kind of enlightenment uh, position a rationalist position there's a uh, there's a direct connection between uh, descartes uh, desire to have clear and distinct cognition <coughs> and clara, which is, means clear, and which is compared with a with a with a painting <coughs> or a style and so on, uh, sort of the stability of a certain conventionality. But above all, above all, in connection with 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 uh, uh, Nathaniel, um, with the belief that self consciousness volition. Uh, can uh, essentially dominate desire and anxiety. You see, and that's the basic, you know, dispute that they that they have. And uh, on page ninety six, for example, at the bottom, she says, "Perhaps there does exist a dark power which fastens onto us and leads us off along a dangerous and ruinous path which we otherwise would not have trodden. But if so, this power must have assumed within us the form of our self." indeed must have become ourself, for otherwise we would not listen to it, otherwise there'd be no space within us in which it could perform its secret work. So there, she defines something that is absolutely, you know, uh, uh, how to say it, that, you know, that describes his, his, his doom, really. He's been taken over, he's been possessed by this dark power, which becomes him, he becomes it. It's not another, simply. It is an other that is uh, himself. Uh, but, and, and then she goes on completely un illogically, but if we possess a firm mind, and that, that word firm should echo from Descartes, remember he wants to establish firm and lasting foundations, uh, and so on, a mind strengthened through living cheerfully. Uh, this, this is, by the way, a typical, I have to say, sort of Protestant uh, response. You don't, go, you don't go to the church to, you know, for aid. You have to live uprightly and so on. Uh, but the trouble is, living cheerful. How do you live cheerfully if you're possessed by this uh, uh, the sense of sin, guilt, and 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 despair? You know, I mean, uh, despair is is sort of the name of the game of part of it. A mind strengthened by living cheerfully, we shall always be able to recognize an inimical influence for what it is. It's like the power of positive thinking. That was, and I don't know if you, any of you have heard of that in the '40s or '50s. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy named Dale Carnegie mm -hmm. uh, wrote books, you know, self-help. The power of positive thinking, keep smiling, and so on. And so, forth. Um, so, if we're able to recognize an inimical influence for what it is, and then that uncanny power truly <laughs> must surely go under in the struggle we must suppose takes place before it can achieve that form, which is, as I've said, a mirror image of ourselves. So, she really is describing very exactly, uh, even from Lacanian point of view, you know, the, the the process that has gone on here, identification with a mirror image that is absolutely self-destructive, you see, uh, in, a, in, a certain, in a certain sense. And that, uh, but that's the trouble is, in, unlike Luther, she's asking him to be able to make a, a, a deliberate, voluntary decision to rid himself of this, what he's become, basically. It's a little like in Rosemary's Baby. Any of you seen Rosemary's Baby? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, part of the ironic thing in our Rosemary Baby is you have uh, Mia Farrow running uh, like mad. She, she's pregnant, and she's trying to save her baby from the devil who, and, and his, his, his advocates who are after her, not knowing that her, she's carrying the devil's baby. 
So the, you know, the more she runs, the, the the better it is. She's trying to protect her baby and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the the uh, the irony of that, uh, you know, in, in that uh, in that film. And, and it's also the situation of the Freudian, the Freudian situation of repression is, you know, you can't run from it, so you repress it, you eliminate it from your self consciousness, but it doesn't go away. It's there, and it's still, you know, influencing influencing you. Um, yeah, let me look a little bit for and see, see what else there. Uh, uh, yeah, it's very also very very interesting that uh, we first uh, then uh, um, first perceives Olympia. That's I guess around uh, in the letter to Lothario, on page ninety nine. She, he, she seemed not to notice me. Her eyes had, in general, something fixed and staring about them. I could almost say she was sightless, as if she was sleeping with her eyes open. It made me feel quite uncanny, and I crept softly away into the neighboring lecture room. And afterwards, I found out it was Franzani's <coughs> daughter. That, uh, it, it, uh, in a way, in other words, what he then falls in love with is precisely. Uh, the realization in a certain sense of what he's most afraid of. That is, a robot who doesn't see as a living being, and it's precisely that, that the, see, he has nothing more to lose. That's an example. Uh, it's as if it, it temporarily assuages his fear enough to allow him to desire what seems to be a complete feminine being uh, because it's already lost. It's already lost what, at some level, he, you know, he realizes the eyes no longer see. They're glazed and so on. And uh, uh, Benjamin, by the way, in his Baudelaire essay, and uh, also writes about eyes that don't see. And he has two interesting examples of them in connection with Baudelaire. The eyes of, 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 of prostitutes often. He says that uh, he distinguishes sex from eroticism, and, or an eroticism of uh, not being personally involved. You know, the, 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 the prostitute uh, looks at the that the person as a customer, you know, and so on, doesn't really see anything more than the, the fee or something like that, that that's there. But it's also the eye of the camera, the, 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 the film camera or the, or the photography camera, uh, the, 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 the uh, photo apparatus, um, which also in a way uh, uh, looks but doesn't see because there's no unified, identifiable consciousness behind it. And so Benjamin talks about how different it is to, for example, to play before a, a, a live audience on the, in theater and also to play in a, you know, in a film. In a film where you're playing before an eye that is totally, in a way, anonymous in some sense. But yeah, that's the way he describes it, uh, which is not coupled with uh, a unified consciousness. It's not an I and you relationship there where you expect reciprocity. It's precisely not that. And he, 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 what he, what he suggested that there is a certain erotic excitement connected with that in both cases, <coughs> in both, in, in, in both cases there, there, uh, it's uh, the, presumably precisely the the attraction of being liberated from uh, the the constraints of a single ego, whether it's your own ego or the ego of of, of the other, uh, in uh, kind of uh, an attraction of a certain type of promiscuity. I guess is what he's what he's referring to, there. To which he was very sensitive, by the way. He was very aware of that and very fascinated. And he makes this connection with the camera, which is quite interesting. There, you know, the, the, the it's a different way of playing. So you see, that again raises the question of the audience. You know, does the audience have to be present? Does the audience have to be uh, react immediately? Uh, does it have to be a self conscious audience, or can it be uh, a more abstract, you know, representation of otherness? But still important, even more important, perhaps in some in some ways. You know, these are sort of interesting, uh, uh, you know, questions. And um, uh, actually, you know, when you're writing or when you're, I think, when you're performing and so on, uh, you're always in, in, involved in a little bit of both. In other words, you can always inter you can always anticipate to some extent who might be reading, who might be uh, coming to your performance, but you can never do that exhaustively. You know, and, and that's part. So you always have a mixture of these two elements of anonymity. And of uh, and of identifiability, you know, you can on one hand you can try to identify it. I know you, you're Andre Deck. I know where you live. I know where you're coming from. What you're expecting. 
But on the other hand, there's always going to be something else there in that in that audience. The audience can never be uh, reduced to that in, so, in, in, in some sense. But here you have the sort of the the opposition of the uh, self-consciousness of Clara and the automatic non-consciousness of, Oli of Olympia there, there and so on there. Um, so, um, yeah, and this comes in a way, uh, very, uh, um, I'm skipping to page 105, to the poem that he then writes. It's really quite you know, amazingly modern. I mean, you could go to an analyst, I don't know if it would have helped, but he does a lot of things that, you know, he does pretty much everything he could do to help himself. One of the things that he does is then to write this poem and try to you know, articulate his, his, his fantasies and fears. So he depicts himself and Clara as united in true love, page 105. Um, you have that? Mm -hmm. But now and then it was as if a black hand, you remember the Coppelius hand, reached out over them and erased their feelings of joy. At last they were standing before the marriage altar. The terrible Coppelius appeared and touched Clara's lovely eyes, which sprang out like blood-red sparks, singeing and burning onto Nathaniel's bre breast. It's just, you know, this fantasy, not just of losing your eyes, but this is, the, the, I think, the key point here. The eyes jump out, almost of their own volition, but it's not your volition. So that's the auto... That's the element of autoeroticism, uh, which is a, a, a misnomer. That is, parts of your body have their own, their own desires, mm -hmm. which are not controlled by your ego. They're not under your command. And they're ready to jump, to leave the rest of the body, if necessary, in order to, to fulfill them. And they're dangerous to a certain notion of wholeness. That's why they burn and they, you know, and so on. If, if being alive means being self-conscious in a unified sense. And by the way, that is not as idealistic a presupposition as you might think. You know, usually think being alive, being dead is an organic. But if you've been, under, you know, anybody who's had experience with people who have been in cases where their self-consciousness is really very, 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 very reduced, knows that the whole question of what it means to be alive, you know, is very difficult. You know, at what point does somebody, can you say, somebody cease to be living in the sense that you think of that word? You know, which they don't recognize, they have no, in that sense, if, if self-consciousness is really reduced, they're still organically there. But even before a coma, I'm not talking necessarily about a, a comatose situation, which is even, you know, more. Uh, so um, all, this, this problematizing of self-consciousness shouldn't be understood as, in some sense, a dispensing of self-consciousness, but rather a resituating of the self of self-consciousness with respect to what I call heterogeneity. In other words, you have the sense of self can be, I believe, even stronger to the extent to which it is open to acknowledging its heterogeneity and not trying to uh, uh, control everything from within its, its what's familiar to its consciousness in some sense, if, if you see what I mean. What would you say then for, say, um, like a hyper-consciousness? Like, so the, the rule of consciousness then is um, I think fairly well clear, <laughs> but the then sort of like a hyper consciousness. What do you think would be sort of the result or sort of? You know, well, the way I mean, I'm not sure exactly what uh, you know what that means. But uh, the distinction I was making before, I'm not sure if you were here when I was talking about that, is that I try to def the way I'm using the term self consciousness, at least in the traditional sense, and there may be other kinds hope that are possible, is consciousness of a, of a self that is ultimately comprehensive and unified and that is, in a way, self-contained. It can change and all, but that is basically uh, uh, um, is identical with itself over the changes. It's not open to radical uh, transformation in some sense. Whereas, it seems to me what Freud calls the unconscious could be considered a form of hyper-consciousness. Uh, why? Because the unconscious behaves very much like a consciousness. In other words, uh, that is, it, it knows, it recognizes. If it didn't know and recognize, it couldn't repress. Repression only, all the, the, all the mechanisms that Freud assigned to the unconscious, and mainly repression, but there are lots of others as well, only make sense if con this form of consciousness knows what it's doing. Mm. If it doesn't recognize that, you know, uh, in what, it may recognize through feeling or through tension rather than through conceptualizing. That may be the big difference. But it will in some way recognize that a certain thought or a certain image or a certain memory is very disruptive. 
it, and that has to be repressed and replaced by something else, if it, then it wouldn't, no, it wouldn't function in the way Freud says it, it, it functions, you see. So that's why I think you know, Lacan says at various points that the unconscious is a form of thinking and a form of, of, and I would say it's a form of consciousness, but it is not accessible to our self-consciousness insofar as the self of that self-consciousness demands unity and harmony of some sort uh, uh, there. So that, uh, 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 that, and that's what's going back and forth here with, uh, you know, with, with, with Nathaniel and, uh, and, Cla and, and, and Claire. Now, I don't know if that's what you mean by, by hyper-consciousness. Uh, it is to some extent, and I guess the, the, the only thing, and I, I agree with yeah. everything, uh, the only thing I'd say is that there is situations in which I believe that there is um, sort of a unification in terms of uh, the access of the self, of the consciousness into the unconscious, uh, which I believe through hallucination. Um, uh, schizophrenia is an example in which uh, subconscious or unconscious elements will oftentimes bubble up through into um, the conscious element of the brain and will be sort of exposed to that. And so you end up with a, uh, sort of a thing where the, yeah. the reality of the situation and the, the sureness of the, the conceptualization and of the self right. becomes very much in question. But it's not in question so much as you, you don't know... Um, who you are or that you're alive, it's right. actually quite the opposite, it's that you're too alive, it's that there's too much happening and you can't, you can't control it. Well, you know, in some, in some ways a lot of that applies to the Freudian unconscious as well, because when you repress something, you never just repress it, it has to, its place has to be taken by something else, that's where a symptom, or, it's always replaced, so that repression is actually a kind of a two-way relation, something is repressed, let's say a desire to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a desire to, to, to harm your father, let's say, or to do away with the father, the father very you know, schematic. And instead, it, it's, it's, it's replaced by a phobia, the fear of little Hans to be go out in the street and being bitten by a horse. Mm. See, And it's absolutely necessary that there be that other replacement in order for the repression to work. It isn't just, you know, shunt it aside. So, and uh, the way Freud describes it, particularly later on, is this is a very dynamic, Relation. He says, what's been repressed proliferates. It doesn't just stay, you know, stand still. It requires constant energy, first of all, and to be repressed. And secondly, it's constantly uh, making demands and wanting to come back, you know, impose itself on. So there's always an interaction. You, know, you can't talk about the unconscious apart from self-consciousness. But the initial point is that what's, what is unconscious is not as such any more directly accessible to self-conscious, your waking, your waking consciousness, but it is indirectly impinging on it all the time, in a way, you see. So uh, already you get, I'm not saying this is the same thing as what you're describing, it's not the case of schizophrenia there, but this is, a, this is still where you have a more overall unified, you know, uh, 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 psyche than you have in schizophrenia, which Freud you know, didn't really work with very much there.